Welcome to Blue Collar Catholic. This is um, our third installment of Blue Collar and a Scholar, where a blue collar guy, a regular blue collar guy, yours truly, gets to talk to a scholar. Today, we probably have the most scholarly scholar I've ever heard of in my life. Uh, he, uh, I said on a video today, I look at him like the modern day William F. Buckley, and uh, I'm really interested to hear his thoughts on the uh, current political state of our country, the state of our church, as well as a lot of, uh, I got a lot of personal questions I like to ask him. But for those of you who are not familiar uh, with Dr. George, this is a, a little bio of his. Uh, Robert P. George is a McCormick Professorship of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He has served as Chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and the President's Council on Bioethics. He has also served as a U.S. member of UNESCO's World Commission on the Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and Technology. He was a judicial fellow at the Supreme Court of the United States, where he received the Justice Tom C. Clark Award. A Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Swarthmore, he holds the degrees of JD and MTS from Harvard University and the degrees of Doctor of Philosophy, Bachelor of Civil Law, Doctor of Civil Law, Doctor of Letters degree, all from Oxford University, as well as having 22 honorary doctorates. He's a recipient of the US Presidential Citizens Medal, the Honorific Medal for the Defense of Human Rights of the Republic of Poland, the Canterbury Medal of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, the Bradley Prize, the Irving Crystal Award of the American Enterprise Institute, and Princeton University's President Award for Distinguished Teaching. His books include Making Men Moral, Civil Liberties, and Public Morality, and in defense of natural law. What impressed, I mean, this is all very impressive, but one thing that really stood out for me that uh, is not in the short bio is that although Ro Dr. Robert P. George is one of the greatest conservative thinkers of our time, liberal Supreme Court Justice Alina Kagan said this about him. And this is from your book, Conscience and its Enemies. Uh, I was pretty impressed when I read this. Robert George is one of the nation's most respected legal theorists. His many accomplishments are due to his sheer brilliance, the analytic power of his arguments and the range of his knowledge. But there is still more. There is a deeply principled conviction, a profound and enduring integrity. To me, that was very impressive. And what I love about you, Dr. George, is that you're one of the few conservatives left that can dialogue with our opponents. Uh, I see you all the time on YouTube with Dr. Cornell West, and you guys seem to have a very close friendship. Uh, Indeed. Uh, now, we, we talked a little bit before we went on air, and I assume Dr. Cornell West kind of grew up underprivileged, and you kind of grew up well off. And actually, it was kind of the reverse, correct? <laughs> 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 well, uh, I, I grew up in the hills of West Virginia. Uh, as you know, I can prove that. I'm a bluegrass yeah, banjo player. Yeah, and that was another thing we spoke about. My son has them all over his YouTube playing bluegrass. <laughs> my uh, grandfathers were both coal miners, uh, wow. both immigrants. Uh, my uh, m uh, mom's dad was able to save up some money after mining for many years and uh, went into a little grocery business. My dad's dad uh, remained working in the mines and then on the railroads for his entire life. Wow. Uh, he was a, a, a laborer. Uh, he, uh, of course, they didn't go to college. My uh, parents didn't go to college either. I'm the first in my family to go to college. I would probably be in the coal mines today, Rob, but for World War II. Hmm. Uh, my father was drafted out of high school. He hadn't even finished. Uh, they, uh, they took him, uh, sent him to Normandy. Uh, to fight in World War II. He, um, uh, they sent his parents, the high school sent his parents a diploma. Wow. <laughs> uh, and when he came back, of course, uh, after the war, uh, there were new opportunities for him. Now, unfortunately, he didn't have the opportunity realistically to uh, go to college, take advantage of the GI Bill, uh, but he didn't have to work in the coal mines. And as a result of that, I'm not uh, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in the coal mines. 
Uh, Cornell grew up in Sacramento, California. He was originally born in Oklahoma, where his grandfather was a very, very well-known minister, a wow, famous that explains, preacher. That explains uh, Cornell's mom and dad were both uh, college educated. Uh, his mother was uh, an almost legendary school teacher, uh, Irene West, and the school at which she taught is now uh, named for her, the Irene West uh, uh, School uh, in, in, in Sacramento. Absolutely lovely, wonderful, charming, very gifted woman. I can see where Cornell uh, gets his smarts. Uh, uh, she died only recently. Uh, uh, I'm so sorry that, uh, that, that we lost her. Uh, but I was glad to, to, to get to know her because she was the mother of such a dear friend of, of, uh, of mine. So, uh, so yeah, uh, Cornell actually did come from a college educated uh, background and, and I didn't. How, I'm curious how you guys became such close friends. Uh, and cause this kind of a two part question. Um, in this, you know, in this day and age, I have a lot of friends that just like in the past four years were a lot of blue collar guys were never involved in politics. And, um, the last four years, they got involved and uh, they're really paying attention. And then when I try and tell them we need a dialogue with the left, they don't understand. They, they think, no, the left is trying to destroy our country. The left is trying to destroy you. And they kind of liken it to 9-11 when Al-Qaeda was, was at war with us, but we didn't realize that we were at war. And I have a friend, he uh, always says this quote from Cato, uh, Carthage must, must die. <laughs> And he's a Spanish guy, so he says it in, <clears throat> excuse me, he says it in Latin. And uh, he says, that's their mentality. That's got to be ours. This is why we keep losing. Would you, I don't think you agree with that statement, but why wouldn't you? And how did you become such close friends with such an opposite political uh, uh, a friend? He's a friend, but he's, uh, you know, we say opponent, yeah. political opponent. Uh, well, well, first, let me say that I do believe that we need to stand up for our values and fight hard for them in the political domain. Okay. Um, uh, we believe in what we believe in because we believe it's true. Okay. Uh, we believe in certain principles, including principles of morality, justice, human rights, uh, the common good. Uh, we fight not for our own self-interest, uh, but for the sake of the common good, the good of all of us, uh, for ourselves as Americans, for our great country, which we should all be so grateful for, mm -hmm. uh, for humanity. Uh, so we should be people of conviction and stand up for what we believe and fight in the domain of democratic politics, democratic deliberation, fairly, honestly, with integrity, but fighting hard with determination to win for what we believe in, the sanctity of human life in all stages and conditions. Amen. Marriage is the conjugal union of husband and wife, the family, uh, the importance of uh, bringing up children, uh, to be persons of uh, dignity and integrity, uh, able to, uh, uh, to take responsibility for themselves. Uh, there, this and these and many, many other values are things that we need to be uh, fighting for. And your friends are right that there are some people on the left who simply want to crush us. They don't have the same attitude toward uh, the political contest that I've just articulated from my perspective on the conservative side, that there are other people on the left. I wish there were more, but there are people on the left like Cornell West, my dear friend and brother, who do believe in fighting fairly. He and I disagree about things. He's a person of conviction just as I am. He fights for his values. He fights hard. Uh, he stands up for them. He's determined to win because he thinks they are what justice and the common good uh, require. Um, so let's have a, a strong battle, a fair fight, but one that respects the norms of democratic deliberation. In a democratic republic like, like ours, uh, Rob, uh, there are no permanent defeats because there are also no permanent victories. Uh, we can always go back if we've lost in the struggle, whether we're on the right or the left, to our fellow citizens and say, we need to rethink this. We need to go back and, and redo this. We need to try again. We got it wrong last, last time. We need to get it right. We can, we can fight for what we think justice and the, uh, and the common good uh, require. Uh, now it's true, your, your friends are right. There are, there are people on the left who wanna shut down freedom of thought for those of us on the conservative side, freedom of speech. They want to attack our religion. 
uh, especially Catholicism. They loathe Catholicism. Uh, they, they fight hard against every Catholic nominee to the Supreme Court, for example, or any, every Catholic nominee that is actually Absolutely. faithful <laughs> to the Catholic Absolutely. faith. They love Catholics who are pro-abortion and yeah, yeah. pro-gay marriage and that Absolutely. kind of stuff. But, uh, but they will um, do everything they can to assassinate the character of uh, someone like Amy Coney Barrett, uh, exactly. for example. Uh, anyone who is actually a, a faithful uh, Catholic. Uh, so that's the reality. It's a, it's a complex reality. But Cornell and I have a friendship that's built on certain common values. As much as we may disagree about many important political and even moral issues, we have some common values. We believe in the inherent dignity of the human being. We believe in uh, the principle that every member of the human family is uh, a bearer of profound, inherent, and and equal dignity. Now, I believe this gets Cornell into a jam on the issue of abortion, for example, where he has, at least up till now, tended to support the pro-choice, so-called pro-choice side of things. But I know he's extremely nervous about that. I, I know that he's listening carefully to the arguments that I and others are making for the right. dignity of the child uh, in the womb. Uh, I know he's open to hearing argument uh, about that precisely because of his belief in, in human dignity. He's not a dogmatist. He's not an ideologue who's not gonna listen uh, to arguments that uh, I make or, or, or others make. We also have a deep belief in the Democratic Republican um, uh, project, the project of Republican democracy, that we should have government that's not only of the people, which all government is, <laughs> And not only for the people, which all good government is, even if it's the government of a benign despot, but government by the people. Mm. That is where ordinary people like you and me, ordinary folks, working class people, as well as the wealthy, uh, uh, people who uh, uh, are high school educated or haven't even finished high school, have just as much to say as people who have four PhDs. Uh, we believe in a, in a and a principle of government that gives everyone that right to participate in decision making. And we believe that the protection of freedom of speech is absolutely essential for all of us. So Cornell fights hard against those on the left, even though he himself is on the left, he fights against the people on the left who wanna shut down the speech of people like me and you. And was it a big ally. Wasn't it uh, Dr. West and yourself who generated that letter amongst the uh, university's professors to protect free speech? Or were you well, guys thank you for, for mentioning that, Rob. And, and, and your viewers and listeners, I hope, will we'll, um, uh, go to the internet and do a search and look for Truth Seeking Democracy and Freedom of Thought and Expression. That's the title of the statement that uh, Cornell West and I put out together in 2017. Truth Seeking Democracy and Freedom of Thought and Expression. And there we make the case that the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of justice in the Republican democratic order both require deep respect, principled respect for the freedom to dissent, the freedom to disagree, the freedom to express your opinions. And when people, in these days, it's coming mostly from the left, not exclusively, and historically it hasn't been exclusively from the left, that's for sure, but today, mostly from the left, when yeah. people try to shut down free speech, they try to cancel people who express a dissenting viewpoint. They want to deplatform people, kick people off Twitter and, and, and Instagram and Facebook and so forth, shut down uh, uh, arguments that people are prepared to make, uh, ban certain books or at least ban certain books from platforms like uh, Amazon. When people on the left are doing that today, Cornell is out there every bit as vigorously, maybe even more vigorously than I am to say, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. It's a violation of fundamental rights and liberties. So I really respect Cornell for being willing to stand up against the people on his own side of the political divide and, and take a stand for what's right. Amen. And for the record, he's always been my favorite liberal. <laughs> Whenever I've seen him on TV, I'm like, there's something about that guy. I just like him. He just has the joy of the Lord, even though... I disagree with him totally on politics. He's just he, very he does indeed. And, and I've never heard him say like a mean and harsh word against his opponent. He's probably the only liberal I could say that about. <laughs> uh, you know, recently he did something that was very important. Uh, as you may know, uh, there's an assault uh, on the field of classics 
uh, one that's being waged in some cases from within the field of classics by professors <laughs> of classics. Uh, and uh, part of this assault is an attempt to stigmatize classics as an inherently racist uh, discipline. Absolutely. And so there have been efforts to abolish classics uh, or to fundamentally transform it beyond uh, recognition. There have been efforts to, uh, you know, get rid of the teaching of Homer in schools or uh, Plato and Aristotle, Cicero. Um, and recently, and regrettably, Howard University, the most famous of all our historically black universities, probably the most distinguished of our historically black universities, announced that it was closing its classics department. Wow. And most people on the left didn't make a peep because they just interpreted this as, you know, in line with the idea that we got to abolish racism yeah, and white supremacy and the classics represent that, represents that. And to his credit, God bless him, Cornell in the Washington Post put out a strong editorial denouncing Howard's decision to, to abolish the classics department and pleading with them to reverse course and bring back classics. Cornell understands that Homer and Plato and Aristotle uh, and uh, Thucydides are not just for white people <laughs> any more than Shakespeare is just for white people or Dante is just for white people or just for Italians or whatever. <laughs> uh, and any more than uh, Duke Ellington is only for black people. Amen. Uh, or, uh, or, or, or Ralph Ellison is only for black people. Cornell realizes and stands up for the fact that the great achievements of civilization, whether those whose achievements they are, are black, or white, purple, red, yellow, green, are the common patrimony of humanity. Amen. And we all have to learn from them. Black kids learn as much from studying Plato as white kids. White kids learn as much from studying Ellison as black kids. Okay. We, uh, you, know, you as a white person, I don't know if you happen to love Ellington's music, I do. That, that, that love does not know race. Amen. That is fantastic music, whether you're Italian, Amen. Polish, Chinese, Amen. from Ghana, from Ecuador, it really doesn't matter. I always and say Cornell is bold enough to stand up and say it out loud. Amen. I always say there's only two types of music, good music and bad music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. You know, there's, there's another, speaking of quotes I always quote, there's another quote, I think Ronald Reagan may have, uh, coined the uh, coined the term uh, if you're not a liberal when you're 20 you have no heart if you're not a conservative when you're 40 you have no brain and I noticed uh, Ronald Reagan was a liberal Democrat and uh, I don't know if you would have called yourself a liberal but you were a Democrat starting out as a young man um, my question again is twofold why and what made you change to the Republican Party sure uh, well that that quotation is usually attributed to Churchill Okay, <laughs> but, uh, Reagan used it a lot. <laughs> but evidently it wasn't Churchill who said it. Oh, it wasn't. It. <laughs> I, I, so I think that the historians have figured out that it wasn't Churchill who said it, but they haven't figured out who did say it. Who did, okay. Uh, a lot of quotes like that certain, I've noticed. <laughs> there's a certain amount of truth in it. I mean, it's not absolutely an, no, an no, exceptionally no. true, but there's an awful lot of truth in it. Well, as I said, I grew up in the hills of West Virginia. My grandfathers were, were coal miners. We believed in uh, the union. Okay. Uh, and we believe in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party and the union were like this. They were basically the uh, uh, the same thing. We thought the Democrats were for the working man. Yeah, that's they were how for I grew the coal up. miner. They were for the railroad worker. They were for the factory worker. They were for the people in need. People need a little help. People needed a hand up, not necessarily a handout. We weren't for handouts. No, absolutely. But we thought people need a hand up, and the Democratic Party will give it. And we thought the Republican Party were, there was, there was a bunch of ogres <laughs> and, rich people, and they didn't want to give anybody a hand up or a hand up. They were against the coal miner and they were against the factory worker and they, and were they hated the unions <laughs> and they hated the union. Uh, <laughs> so this is just what I was, what I was brought up with. I mean, I, uh, and where I come from, you know, people did think that Jesus Christ belonged in first place, but they thought Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in second place. And, <laughs> and JFK third, maybe? Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, was, that was coming in there anyway. Uh, but uh, uh, as I was growing up and getting a little older, I, I could see that that this story that we had all come to believe was 
at, at best an oversimplification. Yes. Um, and when I was in my teens, uh, something very dramatic happened, which was that the, the president of the United Mine Workers Union, a guy named Tony Boyle, who was being challenged by a reform uh, movement within the miners, led by a guy named Jock Yablonski, had ordered a hit on Yablonski, had him murdered. <laughs> It's not surprising growing up in Jersey. Yeah, well, you know what I'm talking about. I know, exactly. And that sobered a lot of us up, and that opened a lot of our eyes. We could see the union was not so holy no. and pure. After all, there was corruption. Uh, so as I now like to say, I, I, I used to believe that uh, the union was always in the right and the company was always in the wrong. I still pretty much believe that companies are always in the wrong, but the unions <laughs> are always in the wrong too. <laughs> they, they deserve each other. There you go. Uh, so That's much, fine. so much corruption. Um, the other, uh, the second thing, uh, really three, the second thing, uh, Rob, that I began to, to see, even as a teenager, is I could see that the great society programs that had been introduced in Appalachia, I, I'm sure very well intentioned, uh, trying to help people because we did have a lot of poverty. My, my family wasn't wasn't poor, but we knew a lot of people who were poor. A lot of the people around us were poor, um, and people did need help. But the great society programs that were introduced, I could see, not only weren't helping people; they were hurting some of the very people that they were designed to to help. The reality of welfare dependency was right there now in front of our faces, and there was no way you could fail to see it. There was no way you could fail to acknowledge it in the way it would destroy the souls of people, undermine their dignity, their sense of self-worth, their sense of personal uh, responsibility. So that again got me thinking, not so much that I was going to love the Republican Party, but I could see that what the Democratic Party stood for, the little guy helping the little guy, giving people a hand up, a hand up it didn't seem to be so true. It didn't seem to be working anyway. And then the third thing, and this was in the early 1970s, I was in my late teens. It was really formative years. I could see the Democratic Party moving from being a socially conservative party, every bit as socially conservative, perhaps in some ways more socially conservative than the Republican Party. The early pro-abortion people were almost all Republicans. Wow. Democrats tended to be pro-life. They were ethnics. They were working class. They were That was a pro-life constituency. I could see the Democratic Party now shifting. It was moving from being a socially conservative and pro-life party. What year do you what year do you think that was about? I think he, I, the key year when everything finally started to come into focus for me was 1973. Okay. In 1972, we began to see that what McGovern represented was really a different tendency. This was not my grandfather's Democratic Party anymore, not my father's Democratic Party. This was a socially elite. Uh, increasingly culturally left Democratic Party, but abortion wasn't a big issue. Right, at that point. Um, McGovern himself uh, believed in uh, liberalizing the abortion laws, but he wasn't proposing anything at the national level. Okay. Uh, in 1973, we got Roe versus Wade. Now, that was the work, by the way, of more Republicans than Democrats. Most of the justices on the court who handed down Roe versus Wade were Republicans. Hmm. And one of the two dissenters, Byron White, was or White, was a a Democrat. But yet it was the Democratic Party that locked on to Roe versus Wade and dug in in support of Roe versus Wade. And by 1980, the Republican Party had become fully pro-life uh, under Ronald Reagan. So when the Democratic Party abandoned the unborn child, that was it for me. And you abandoned so them. Then that was it. I wasn't going to stay and fight. I was leaving. I was out of here. This was not what we believed the Democratic Party was all about. Democratic Party was the party of the little guy, and here they were abandoning to lethal violence, the littlest guy of all, the most defenseless yeah. member of the human family, and I just could not accept that. So I was for uh, quite a number of years a, um, a political independent, uh, Rob. Okay. Uh, during those years when I served, uh, initially appointed by President Bush, but then through the, the first President Bush, and then through the uh, uh, first several years of the Clinton administration, uh, on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, I was a political independent. Okay. Uh, the Civil Rights uh, Commission uh, is composed of eight members, and uh, no more than half can be from one political party. But I didn't count against either political party because I was a political independent. Even even though I had uh, had left the Democratic Party, I couldn't bring myself 
uh, to embrace the Republican Party because they were always our enemies. You know, when I, like, <laughs> like a Boston I mean, the, the, fan becoming a Yankee fan. Almost. Yeah, the, uh, when I was growing up, I mean, uh, I, I'll put it to you this way. Not only did we not like Republicans, we didn't know any. <laughs> we were the you know the miners and the children of the miners and the grandchildren of the miners we we were the people uh and we were the people who lived in west virginia uh the republican we were all democrats the republicans were the rich people who lived out of state they didn't even live in the state they owned the mines wow. that exploited our fathers and grandfathers and rich grandfathers and and uh and so forth so it took me a long time to get past that that's interesting. but um uh, around the end of the uh, millennium, in the late 90s or just about 2000, I finally said, look, you know, uh, the Republican Party, I don't agree with everything that the Republican Party stands for, but I agree with a heck of a lot of it. And um, and I certainly don't agree with much of what the Democratic Party really stands for anymore. I mean, some of their rhetoric's okay, but what they really stand <laughs> for is not. What they really do. It's, it's just not anything I can accept. So, um, you know, I registered then finally as a as a Republican. I, I, I did so, though, trembling, fearing that my grandfather <laughs> were rolling in their grave, <laughs> actually Republican. But then I thought to myself, well, you know, darn it, if they were around today, they'd be Republicans, too. I think so. I mean, they were they were they were Christian men. They were serious men. They uh, they were morally serious people. They uh, they wouldn't go in for all this uh, uh, liberal uh, moral craziness that uh, that the left has embraced and the Democratic Party now has embraced. You know, what, what I, um, I came back to the Catholic, I was baptized Catholic, you know, Italian kid from Jersey, uh, but I never really went to church much. And then I became an evangelical in the Navy. I had an experience oh. with Christ and he really transformed my life. And for 30 years, I served God in evangelical churches. And about six years ago, through studying, you know, scholars like Scott Hahn and Peter Criff, they led me back into the Catholic mm -hmm. church. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit led me, but he used men like such as those, um, and I was surprised that so many devout Catholics still vote Democrat. And the argument is they're economically progressive. And I always say my argument, and I want to hear your argument, is that if you're a social conservative, you must be a fiscal and economical conservative, too, because it helps more poor people than, like you said, the uh, great society actually hurt people. How would you argue that? I mean, do you... Would you agree that to be socially conservative, you must be economically conservative as well, or fiscal conservative? Uh, I have an essay uh, on that. It's the first chapter of my book, Conscience and Its Enemies. That, that's the book you were reading that nice uh, quotation from Elena uh, Kagan from. Um, and so people are interested in my thought about the relationship of economic and uh, uh, social conservatism might have a look at, at that chapter. Uh, again, the book is Conscience and Its Enemies. Yeah, it's actually page um, 19, I believe. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think that Catholics can be or should be dogmatic libertarians. Uh, I think we should affirm the market as far better than the command economy. Uh, so in that way, we're economic conservatives. But we're not dogmatic libertarians. We recognize that there can be good reasons for government regulation. Those reasons are basically the classic ones um, of uh, protecting public health, safety, and morals, and advancing the, the common good. I, I also believe in the social safety net. But the safety net should be really a safety net. We in the Catholic tradition have a wonderful principle. It's been borrowed by people outside our tradition, and they're they're welcome to borrow it. I, I love it when they when they um, learn from some of the riches of our tradition. It's called subsidiarity, and subsidiarity is the idea that uh, problems should be solved at the lowest level at which they can be effectively solved. So people have the most control over their own lives. The people who know best what's best for themselves and their families can make the key decisions. So if the family can solve the problem, the, the, the family should do it. The family should manage it. For example, the question, where should the children go to school? Should they go to public school, private school, uh, religious school, Catholic school? Uh, should they be homeschooled? That should not be a decision made by anybody other than mom and dad. Amen. Because they are the best people in the best position to make the decision. Now, some things can't be done just by the family. So they should be done as close to the family as, as possible. So let's say the community needs a library. 
no one family can afford a library, but we could, you know, join together, maybe a private foundation, create a private foundation to build a library. Um, where, where it can't be done by private initiative, we need to bring in government. Maybe the, we need the municipal government to build a swimming pool. But let's, in those situations, let municipal government, which is closest to the people, make the decision about the swimming pool, not the faraway federal government. So always make the decision at the lowest possible level. Now, there's some things that can't be done except by the central government. The defense of our borders, the defense of our country. You blessed our country by serving in the Navy, and I'm so grateful for your service and the service of so many of our uh, fellow citizens who are veterans. But you know, the the, the Navy can't be run privately. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a government function, right. and and it can't be. You can't have individual states with navies or individual cities with navies. There are some things that have to be done at the national level. Our, our constitution affords to the national government the power to regulate commerce among the several states. And that's a very wise thing to do. We would be all disadvantaged, we'd all be harmed, the economy would be undermined if New Hampshire could set up tariff barriers against <laughs> Massachusetts and so forth, or, or Virginia against North Carolina and vice versa, trade wars among states and things like that. So there are some things that need to be done all the way up at the top at the national level. Okay, we do them there. But if they don't need to be done there, then they need to be done lower down. If they don't need to be done by government, they need to be done by private initiative, churches, uh, civic associations, and, and most fundamentally, where they can be done by the family, like decisions about children's schooling. Let those decisions be made by the family. That's the principle of subsidiarity, and that has implications for our economics. Where the market can function well it's going to lift all of us. Amen. The free markets have lifted millions and millions of people out of poverty. There's no greater job creation uh, pro uh, program in the world than, than, than the market. Amen. But, but you can't simply fetishize the market. You can't rely entirely on the market. There's some things that shouldn't be sold, right? We shouldn't be able to sell ourselves or our children into slavery. Amen. We shouldn't be able to sell drugs. We shouldn't be able to sell obscene pornographic uh, material. Uh, we, there, I believe there shouldn't be a market in vital organs. There's some things Amen. that we don't let the market handle, Amen. right? We regulate the market for the sake of public health, safety, and morals. We also regulate the market to make sure it functions as a market, that it's competitive. That's why we have antitrust laws. That's why we uh, are, are, are willing to use the law uh, to prevent anti-competitive uh, trade practices. Here's something I'll say to uh, your, the people you're talking about, your Catholic friends and, 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 and others who vote for the Democrats and believe in these big government democratic programs. Do you think big business is against big government? No. They're I, not. I, yeah, they are, they are. Nobody <laughs> loves the government as much as big business does. Yeah, you're right. I mean, they, they are in bed together from morning right. to night. Amen. You are. And, and, and what that produces is what we have way too much of, crony capitalism. Amen. When, when big business owns big government, they use big government to impede the entry into the market of competitors, of upstart competitors who can't afford the entry costs because of excessive government regulation. That government regulation doesn't uh, harm the big boys. It doesn't harm the big corporations. It benefits them immensely. They can easily afford those costs, and that keeps the the, the competition out. You, so you, I want to say, let's be real here, folks. If you think the Democratic Party, with its big government programs, is the enemy of big business and is protecting you from big business, man, think that one through again because <laughs> it is the reverse of the truth. Amen. And it and it's and it's not by accident. It's by design. <laughs> <you're saying. laughs> no, what we need is actually a, a free a freer market. The, the the problem is not that we have too much of a free market. It's that the so-called free market is a fake. We've got crony capitalism. You know, government contracts themselves are uh, control a great deal of of the economy. And those we we're supposed to have uh, competitive bidding. But you know how much corruption there. You, you're a working man yourself, right? I mean, you, you know how much corruption there is in, <laughs> in that sort of thing. I mean, uh, the government interventions in the economy uh, on the scale and in the way that they are uh, made simply uh, reinforce the crony 
dimension of crony capitalism. Man, no, you're absolutely right. So what you just explained, you're saying is a Catholic teaching. The doctrine of subsidiarity, that's right. And how that, far you know, does that go back to St. Thomas Aquinas or even before him? Well, it's formally worked out only uh, in the modern uh, period, and it gets that name subsidiarity in the modern, modern period, okay. with the 19th century uh, uh, Catholic writers, uh, for example. But the principle itself, although not articulated um, with precision and, and without the label attached to, you can, in fact, find in Thomas Aquinas and even going back earlier into the writings of the of the Greeks. You know, if you if you look at Aristotle, you'll get at least the kind of um, uh, rudimentary form of the of, of, of the argument. You know, the polish shouldn't do everything. The family has some things that it's supposed to do. And really what the polis is, is a family, is a family of families. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's a kind of distribution of power. Uh, when, when Republicans talk about limited government, they're right to the extent that limited government means respecting the doctrine of subsidiarity, okay. making sure that government isn't given the power to intervene in areas where we should be doing things for ourselves. I do not want the government telling you or me or anyone else where to send our children to school. And that would play out in the real world as school choice. You would be in favor of school choice, I would imagine. School, absolutely, uh, absolutely. There's a famous case in the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan uh, was riding very high in Oregon. And at that point, the Ku Klux Klan uh, was every bit as much an anti-Catholic organization as it absolutely. was an anti-Black or anti-Jewish organization. And under the influence of the Klan, Oregon, uh, which you know, was pretty strongly anti-Catholic territory to begin with in those days, still is in some ways. Uh, but in any event, the the Oregon legislature passed legislation that basically required parents to send their kids to public schools. The idea there was to Protestantize the kids, or kids at least decatholicize de the kids. You had these immigrants coming in from allegedly anti-democratic or undemocratic countries, belonging to an undemocratic church lacking the democratic sensibilities and so forth that you get from Protestantism. So they uh, they tried to force Catholic parents to send their kids uh, to, to public that. schools. The case is called uh, Pierce Against the Society of Sisters. And to its great credit, the Supreme Court struck down the Oregon law as unconstitutional on the ground that parents have the right to direct the upbringing and education of their children. That's just a straightforward implication of the principle of subsidiarity. And that was 1920, you said? In the 1920s. I don't remember what it was, 1923 or 1924. That's very in interesting. The, yeah, in the 1920s. So when I think of a coal miner, I don't think of a Catholic. Was your family Catholic? Yes. On my father's side, uh, they were Eastern Orthodox, Syrian okay. Orthodox. My uh, grandfather and grandmother came from Syria. Okay. Uh, on my mother's side, they were Calabrian. They were Italians. Okay. And, uh, and, right. and Catholic. So I was uh, brought up um, uh, with both the uh, both of the long, you remember John, John Paul II famously said that we need to unify the East and the West because the church needs to breathe with both lungs. Right. Well, I was brought up with both lungs with a, with awesome. a Syrian Orthodox family with a beautiful Eastern tradition on the one side and the Catholic uh, Western tradition on the other side. That's interesting. Do you ever see us coming back or do you... Uh before Christ comes back, do you, do you picture the Orthodox and the Catholics coming back together like they once were? Or I, I would love to see it, and I don't rule it out. I, it would be very hard. The divisions within the Orthodox world complicate things enormously. Uh, you know, the, as, as disunified or ununified, I'm not sure what the right <laughs> word is, as, as lacking as, in unity as we are Divided. in the West. <laughs> It's nothing by comparison with the differences on the East. You know, Constantinople and uh, and Moscow have now gotten into a big fight with each other, and I I I think they've fallen out of communion with each other. Uh, there are historic um, uh, bad bad will between some of the different Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, churches. So it's it's hard for for the West and the East to unify when the East itself is so badly disunited. Um, but look, I mean, I, I keep saying it's not our job to unite the church. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit's job to unite the church. It's our job to get the heck out of his way. <laughs> You're right. I mean, we're right. the problem. It's not and, the Holy Spirit. Right? Well, let me let me ask. So so today it seems like it's political division with the East. Now, is it am I oversimplifying it when I look back on history? 
and see the East West split and say that was political. I mean, the, the doctrinal yeah. issues they tell me seem so minute. It seems to me it was political. Am I, am I oversimplifying that? Well, you're thinking like a Westerner, just as I do. <laughs> I, I think it's probably the case that we in the West, on the, we on the Catholic side of this divide, don't perceive the doctrinal or dogmatic differences between us and orthodoxy as insuperable or even as very significant. We think that this whole problem basically began with politics and remains fundamentally a political problem. It has to do with ethnicity, it has to do with governance issues, the distribution of power and so forth. Now, that's not true of people in the East. People in the, in the East, people in the Orthodox community, or the Orthodox world tend to think those doctrinal or dogmatic differences are more significant than we are prepared to admit. Now, I don't agree with them. But again, I'm a Westerner. I'm thinking like a, a Westerner. But I do want to say, okay, fine. If they're big, let's sit down and talk about them. Amen. Right? Maybe we can work this thing out. Amen. But Amen. I can't help thinking that a lot of this has to do with uh, with questions of power. Uh, you know, who's going to be in charge of what? Um, there's a wonderful encyclical. It's the most neglected encyclical of the pontificate of John Paul II. It's called Ut Unum Sint, uh, translated that they may all be one. Wow. And That's basically, cool. he, John Paul II says to, in the encyclical, it's really directed to the East. He says, look, brothers, look, just tell us what the obstacles are. Let us find a way. Wow. Uh, you're, you're worried about us dominating you. You're worried about papal authority being exercised too harshly over you. Uh, you're worried about not having your autonomy respected. Let, let's, let's talk that through. We can handle that. We can make sure your autonomy is respected. We don't want to push you around. We realize that within your jurisdictions on most issues, you have complete authority. You know, the Pope doesn't have to appoint your bishops, shouldn't appoint your bishops. Uh, the, the, uh, you can have your own canon law. The Eastern Rites of the Catholic Church have their own uh, canon law. The Melkites and the Maronites and uh, the Ukrainians and so forth have their own uh, canon law. Now, there are some complications because of the, because of the Eastern Rite Catholic churches. Uh, you know, if we unite, uh, or what happens when you have two patriarchs for the same <laughs> jurisdiction? One, the Eastern Rite like Catholic, <laughs> the, the Eastern Orthodox. But, you know, all that stuff is it's just human problems. They can be worked out, especially if we just get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do it. I think you're right. I think that's well said. Now, speaking of papal authority, what's your take on the um, the restrictions on the Latin Mass? I uh, I kind of see it. I I'll, up front, I've never been to a Latin Mass. I've only been back to the church six years, and I've, I've been to the new Mass since. And I love the new Mass. Uh, it draws a lot of us evangelicals in, so I think it's from the Holy Spirit. Um, but as an enlisted man in the Navy, if the Admiral of the Navy made some kind of big change that affected me, I would assume that he knows more than I know. I'm just an enlisted guy. I wouldn't assume that he, I wouldn't expect him to come on my YouTube channel and say, Rob, let me consult and get your opinion of this. But I see a lot of very godly men that I respect are getting very, very upset and angry, you know, righteous anger maybe, or hurt and they're expressing it, you know, in a way that seems angry. And these are good men. They're not divisive men. They're not uh, ungodly men. Uh, so I'll, I'm a little confused, you know, being, like I said, I've only been back six years. So what's your take on this? Well, before I answer that question, I want to go back to your own story, which was so interesting. Uh, not though, uh, although very interesting, by no means unique. I've known so many people who were, who were brought up as Catholics, fell away from the faith, uh, got really came back to Christianity through the evangelical community. In some cases, like your own, spent decades in the evangelical world before they found their way back to the Catholic Church. And I want to say how much I appreciate what the evangelical community has done for those people, for people Amen. like you. Yes, no, they it's nurtured your faith. You, yes, you should did. never have anything but the greatest gratitude. And all of us Catholics should have nothing but the greatest gratitude to our evangelical brothers uh, for their witness uh, in general. Uh, but certainly for the witness that enabled people like you to, you know, recover 
or rebuild your 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 faith in Christ. Thank uh, you. That we should never be triumphal toward them in any way. Those who do come back to the Catholic Church should never look down on evangelicals. You should always think with gratitude of uh, the evangelical community and what they did for you, and we should all be grateful to them. Um, on the question of the um, Pope's latest um, statement uh, and ruling uh, direction, uh, restricting the old form of the Mass, sometimes now known as the extraordinary form of the Mass or the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, I believe I understand what motivated him. There were in the community of people for whom the Latin Mass is very central, a group, I believe a small group, I believe a very small minority, who not only uh, loved the Latin Mass and preferred to attend it, but who held and sometimes promoted the view that the new Mass, the so-called Novus Ordo, was not valid, or if valid was a distant second in dignity to the true Mass of the, the, of the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, some of these people had even more radical views, uh, including the view that uh, that the Pope is not legitimately Pope. He wasn't legitimately elected Pope. And some of them hold the view that we have not had a, uh, a legitimate Pope since John uh, the 23rd, since Pope John the 23rd before the Second Vatican wow. Council. And I think the Pope was worried that um, these ideas were being spread in the Latin mass community, that the Latin mass, the traditional Latin mass was becoming a rallying point for these ideas. I don't share that empirical judgment. I haven't made a study of it, but I know a lot of people, a lot of Catholics, and a spectrum of them, believe me. I mean, you, when, you, when you do my kind of work, you, you meet Catholics of every description. And I don't think that the ideas uh, that the Pope was rightly uh, concerned about were being widely spread uh, with, the, with the traditional Latin Mass as a rallying point. Uh, therefore, making that empirical judgment, um, I can't help but conclude that it wasn't really necessary and therefore was not advisable to restrict uh, the Latin Mass as, as sharply uh, as, as, as he did. Now, there's still some discretion in the hands of local bishops, and uh, some of them are using them to make sure, using that discretion to make sure that uh, the Latin Mass is available, at least to those who have become uh, accustomed to it and find it especially uh, spiritually nourishing. I, I worry about this coming, this becoming a point of, of disunity. If you look at my uh, Facebook page, I think I have it on public setting, uh, not my public figure pa Facebook page, but the public setting of my uh, personal Facebook page, you'll see that I've posted a statement on this uh, very issue. And it's really a plea to those who love the Latin Mass and who have been so wounded by this decision from the Pope. It's a plea with them not to leave the church. Yeah. I heard, actually, I haven't heard any say they would leave. Uh, I've heard yeah. a lot of them say they're hurt, they're angered. Uh, like you, they say they don't think it was necessary. But I haven't heard any say they would leave. And, and am I right. correct in uh, thinking that a new Pope could lift those restrictions? Just oh, oh yes. I mean, put them in place. <laughs> Yeah, what the Pope was doing here was overriding a previous, more generous and permissive policy of uh, Benedict the Sixteenth. So, uh, what one Pope does in this area, it's not dogmatic. It's it's right. not a dogmatic decision. It's a disciplinary decision. What one Pope does, another Pope can undo. Or perhaps this Pope could have you know could rethink it and say, well, you know, maybe we did go a little bit too far. Let's let's give people a little more room for the traditional Latin. I didn't realize it was going to be so painful uh, for people. I, I hope the Pope would, would do it himself, but, but if not, a future Pope certainly, certainly can do it. I, I think that the danger here is the Pope's decision will become a source of disunity. So I'm pleading with people, uh, and I hope you're right that they're not really intending, people aren't intending to leave, but I'm, I'm, fe I'm hearing so much pain that I worry they're going to be tempted right. to leave. And so I'm pleading with people, don't leave. Uh, now, I, I myself, um, in my very youngest days, uh, remember the Latin Mass. So uh, I was an altar boy in the early 1960s before the change, and uh, it was a beautiful Mass. There's no question about it. Uh, I've occasionally, very occasionally, gone to a, a Latin Mass um, uh, uh, since then, 
but I myself am comfortable with the new mass. Uh, I really prefer uh, the new mass. But in no way do I think that the extraordinary form or old mass is inferior to the to the new mass. Uh, uh, it, it's a it's a wonderful mass, a beautiful mass. And I recognize that for many people, uh, it's really strongly uh, spiritually nourishing. So I hate to see them deprived of that, as I think really unnecessarily. Uh, acknowledging that the that the issues that the Pope was concerned about these crazy ideas that uh, that the new mass is invalid, Pope isn't the Pope. I, I understand his concern that you don't want those to spread. Very interesting. Well, we're gonna um, we're gonna wrap this up, but I do have a get, I do have a political question I was curious about. Uh, sure. In the 2016 primary, I endorsed Marco Rubio as blue collar oh. Catholic, <laughs> and and I know you endorsed Ted Cruz, and and to me, I thought they would both make great presidents. I voted for Marco because I was looking strategically. I thought he was more uh, electable, his likability factor. A lot of people just vote; they're not like me and you that look at the issues. A lot of there's a lot of people that just vote on people they like, and also he would carry the state of Florida. And at the time, now mm -hmm. Florida is solidly red. At the time, Florida, we lost to Obama, I think, uh, twice. Uh, so I was a little nervous about Florida. So I, I publicly endorsed uh, Marco Rubio and actually made a video that um, my Catholic sponsor, when I came back to the Catholic Church, God had put a lot of people in place in my life. And he was a very godly man. He was my landlord. I was renting a, a, a townhouse from him. And I had lost my job. And I went to him. I said, I'm going to be a little bit late. And he's like, don't worry about it, Rob. I was like, I've never had a landlord say, don't worry about it. <laughs> and, uh, but very godly man. I found out he was Catholic and, and I was like, wow, you know, the Lord's leading me back into the church. So long story short, uh, my landlord, Jim Incrod, if you're watching, and I'll never forget you, brother. He was my sponsor when I, for confirmation, because I made communion in second grade, but I never made confirmation. So he was my sponsor and, and uh, I looked to him to spiritual guidance and he was the nicest kindest most soft-spoken man i ever met you know I'm, I'm from jersey everybody's loud and kind of <laughs> kind of rowdy and he was just very soft-spoken and nice and he emailed me when he seen the video i made about uh then it was uh candidate trump and he said rob uh you know uh you basically gave me a loving rebuke because i said some nasty things about him that a good catholic shouldn't have said uh because he had just uh insulted John McCain and being a veteran I kind of took it yeah. personal um uh, so I actually deleted that video but then after um uh, when it was between him and Hillary he was pro-life so I, I had I felt I had a vote for him uh begrudgingly but then after four years of watching him I enthusiastically endorsed him and voted for him in his previous election now, I know that you had endorsed Ted Cruz, and you also said some things that weren't so nice about Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I, I'll bet I outdid you. <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't even say what I said on here. I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> um, did four years of his presidency change your mind at all? Well, uh, I did endorse Ted Cruz. I, I think I endorsed him, though, after Rubio was out i, okay, I yeah, yeah because him. yeah after rubio was out then that was yeah because i i also thought very highly of uh, rubio i Catholic, actually too yeah i endorsed ted uh when um uh it was down i think to him and and, and trump okay um and and ted as you may know was a former student of mine oh i didn't know that yeah i i, 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 I uh, took I all my courses I, I, I supervised his senior thesis uh, you know, we've been close friends for oh, many, hey, that's funny. many, many years. Is he, uh, as, is he as sharp as they say? I hear. He's, oh, yeah. He's oh, yeah. It's brilliant. Important. It was a brilliant thesis. It was um, on the Ninth and Tenth Amendments to the Constitution. Highly original work off the charts for a college student, for an undergraduate, wow. really. And then, of course, he went on to Harvard Law School, distinguished himself there, Supreme Court uh, clerkship, clerking for the Chief Justice. Um, uh, Solicitor General of, of, of Texas, uh, real, you know, high achiever. Um, uh, and then, you know, I, I thought he had a chance of, of stopping stopping the Trump train, uh, but uh, <laughs> but Trump beat number 17. I think there were 19. There were 19. Yeah. <laughs> I think from the very uh, beginning, it was 19. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was not a Trump supporter and, and uh, this 
was a problem for my family back in West Virginia. Uh, they were strong uh, Trump supporters. I, I, I think, right? what, what, yeah, they're blue collar. Yeah, what, what, West Virginia went Trump by nearly seventy oh, percent. I mean, seventy. I mean, oh my goodness! Like sixty-eight or something. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so my, uh, you know, my 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 mother in particular, I think, is um, despairing of me. She she thinks, oh, he's become a liberal. You know, oh no, because <laughs> I'm not Trumpian, Trumpian enough for her. Uh, I, I will admit that I, I was surprised that Trump kept his word about some things that um, that I didn't think he would keep his his word about, including on the pro-life uh, issue. Um, uh, then when he ran the second time, um, uh, ran for re-election against Biden, uh, I published an article together with another of my former students, Ramesh Panuro of uh, National Review, the new editor-in-chief of National Review magazine. Okay. Uh, and the position that we articulated there was that um, while it would be morally impermissible for a Catholic to vote for Biden because of Biden's pro-abortion and pro-gay marriage and so forth positions, uh, it would be morally permissible uh, for a Catholic to vote for Trump despite Trump's <laughs> delinquencies, uh, but not morally required. And that, that's exactly, that's exactly uh, where I uh, ended up. Uh, uh, you know, I, I thought uh, Biden, uh, simply could not be supported by uh, a Catholic who was serious about his faith, because if you're serious about your faith, you believe in the profound and inherent and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family beginning with precious child in the womb. And you know where Biden is on that issue, he even abandoned his yeah, years he's, of support he's, for he's, the Hyde Amendment, which yeah. protected Catholics and other pro-life people from having to pay for, uh, uh, for abortions. Uh, so I thought that it would be permissible, and we we articulated the view that it would be morally permissible for a Catholic to vote for Trump, but not morally required. If, as a matter of uh, of, of witness against some of the um, uh, things Trump uh, said and did, uh, you didn't feel you could vote for him, then you know you could write in, you could vote for third party candidate. To us, it was a matter of discernment. One of the things you might think about is: Are you in a contested state? You know, if you're if you're in a contested state, maybe you'll think about it differently than if you're in a state that's definitely going to go for Trump or definitely going to go for uh, for Biden. Um, so it was a it was you know it was a difficult situation. Um, I'm hoping that we'll uh, get a candidate on the Republican side the next time uh, who doesn't have the some of the moral drawbacks of uh, that President Trump presented. Uh, but it's also as strong as President Trump was on some of the uh, issues where he did, I think, uh, do a good job. Uh, I like uh, Ron DeSantis, for example, from, from down in Florida. I've had the uh, privilege of doing a little bit of work with him. Okay. He's working on uh, education reform in the Florida higher education uh, system, and uh, he's had me uh, involved in helping him with that, and I've gone down and spoken um, for him at the governor's uh, mansion there at a little conference that they did on higher education reform. So I think uh, I continue to that. think highly of uh, Marco uh, Rubio. I, I don't think Ted Cruz is uh, going to uh, to run again, but there are some other uh, rising stars uh, in the Republican uh, Party that I'm that I'm hopeful about. Um, if it wasn't uh, DeSantis or Rubio, who, who would you like to see run? Do you think it's someone off the top of your head? I know it's kind of on the spot. Yeah, I'm, try, I'm, pro I'm probably missing some uh, obvious uh, People, I like Tom Cotton from, um, yes, yes. from Arkansas, yeah. veteran like yourself. Uh, yeah, Tom Cotton is definitely a man of character. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh gosh, uh, there, it's probably obvious people okay. just not yeah. jump, jumping into my head. Uh, just, oh, oh, you know, I like Tim Scott. Tim, I like Tim Scott yeah. from- uh, Yeah, I uh, thought uh, the Santa Carolina. Scott would be a great ticket. I was just that talking to a friend the other day, that would be a, a great ticket, the Santa Scott. I, I, I had, uh, hoped uh, to be able to be enthusiastic about Christy Noem, the governor of South Dakota. But when she abandoned us on the uh, transgenderism uh, issue uh, out there, uh, I was really disappointed in her. Uh, you know, the, she, she came under a lot of pressure to veto a, a, a bill. I think it was a bill to protect women's sports, if I, uh, right. if I remember correctly. And uh, she'd originally been in favor of the bill, but the the left uh, put a tremendous amount of uh, pressure uh, 
and corporations, you know, coming to the defense of the West of the left, uh, put a lot of pr economic pressure on the governor, uh, on Governor Noam, and and she caved in. Similar to what Mike Pence had done uh, before he became vice president when he was governor of Indiana, and he was uh, um, he signed into law a actually fairly weak Religious Freedom Restoration Act, but at least it was something. Well, the the left led by the LGBT movement uh, came down like a ton of bricks and Google and Microsoft and the NCAA and all these these left wing corporations uh, and entities came uh, down on Indiana and Governor Pence caved in and supported the revocation of the of the bill. That was not Mike Pence's finest uh, moment. Mm. Um, and uh, now Asa Hutchinson and the governor of uh, Arkansas is also supposed to be a strong conservative, did the did the same thing. Now, by the way, when you see all these corporations doing the dirty work of the left and putting all this pressure on, uh, uh, who, who do you think they vote for? Do you think they vote Republican, these big corporations, these, these big corporate it's tiny, right? Yeah, it ties right voting. back into how we started. Yeah, these exactly. Big, big yeah. corporations are in bed with the Democrats because they want to uh, hurt the little guy. I, I think the future of the Republican Party is as a working class, multi-ethnic, socially conservative party. I agree. Uh, we're we're not going to get the wealthy and affluent, the the super highly educated. Uh, they've gone off in a different direction, uh, morally and spiritually and politically. Uh, but I I do think that working class black people, white people, uh, Asian people, uh, Latino people, people of all backgrounds, uh, who are socially conservative or on the whole. Uh, tend to be a lot more religious than our elites uh, uh, need to really bind together uh, to uh, be the movement uh, that takes our country back and 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 restores us to our highest and best principles, the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Amen. And the broader the broader principles of the Judeo-Christian tradition that are what made the American founding possible in the first place. The yeah. idea of the dignity of the individual as a creature made in the image and likeness of, of God. And, and I think uh, in your book, Conscious and Its Enemies, you quote uh, James Madison that uh, it takes virtuous people to live in a free society. Is that, am I getting that quote? So, that, that's buddy? exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, to, to be worthy of freedom, to be able to exercise freedom without destroying your country, you need virtue. You need self-control, self-restraint, self-mastery. Uh, a, a, a licentious people is not going to be a free people for very long because they're going to be destroying each other and destroying themselves and destroying their nation. If, if we love liberty, and we should, if we want liberty, and we should, we also need morality. There can be no liberty without morality. Any, any people that tries to have liberty without morality will collapse into tyranny. You can take that to the bank. Amen. And man, history proves that out. Yep. Well, thank you, Dr. George. This was a great, uh, great time. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I'm sure my viewers learned a lot. And uh, you're welcome to come back on anytime. I know you're a super busy guy. <laughs> uh, I, I, I got tired just reading all your degrees. I don't know how you got them all. <laughs> so uh, God bless and uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Rob. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.